There are things that I have done in my life that I should regret, but I don't. Such are the words of my next guest, the Cockney lad from London's impoverished East End who has realized the impossible dream in Hollywood. Academy Award-winning actor Michael Caine has made over 70 films, has worked with such legends as Sir Laurence Olivier, Elizabeth Taylor, and John Huston. And yet, despite his success, Mr. Caine is unchanged, unfazed, and still one of the most versatile and beloved actors of our time. He was born with the unlikely name Maurice Micklewhite, and he grew up in one of London's most dismal slums. It was a hard-fought journey from the East End to Hollywood, and yet he has maintained a leading man status for nearly 30 years now. It all began back in 1966, when an unknown actor named Michael Caine brought a character named Alfie to life. I don't know. It seems to me, if they ain't got you one way, they got you another. So what's the answer? That's what I keep asking myself. What's it all about? And hence came the title for his 1992 autobiography, What's It All About? With his signature wit and style, Michael Caine writes about his movies. He's made over 77 films. His treasured friendships, his disappointments and triumphs, and his passionate love affair with his beautiful wife, Shakira. Candid, vibrant and warm, this is a captivating self-portrait of a man who is at once subliminally ordinary and just simply extraordinary. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for Michael Caine. Scream over the applause here. <laughs> this is coffee, by the way. There's no whiskey or anything. Either. You know, that was one of the interesting parts of your book that I read that when you met your wife, that you were. I, I don't know how you know you were drinking three bottles of vodka a day. I mean, after the first one, how would you know? Or could you count? But You count the bottles in the evening. Oh, I see how many <laughs> empties are left. But she got you to stop drinking, or...? No, it wasn't that. It, it, I, I was uh, drinking two bottles of vodka a day. Oh, excuse me. I always say my wife, my wife helped me with my drinking. She used to drink the other bottle. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it wasn't... No, it wasn't like that. It was I was leading a certain kind of life. Um, which was a sort of a bachelor life, you know, out all night, discotheques, girls, all those terrible things. Wild women yeah. and songs. Wild, yeah, wine women. I didn't do a lot of singing, but there was a lot of wine, so I had to make up with wine and women. And uh, when I met my wife, it... Uh, well, she wasn't my wife. When I met the girl I was going to marry, I, I, it changed my life, you know? I, it changed the, my, my whole outlook on things. And I, obviously, once I met her, I never went out with any more women, so that was the start. When you met her, I understand, is this the true story that you saw her on a, on a Maxwell House commercial? Yeah, I, was, I stayed in one night and watched television, which was something which in the 60s... Couldn't when, get a date that night. No. <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, my best friend and I were exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, just let's have an evening in. Just one in. night. <laughs> one night in, and I said, OK. When we decided, this is my best uh, male friend, and we, we were sitting in my flat, and uh, I was watching the, the TV and, and suddenly this commercial came on uh, for Maxwell House Coffee. And I saw this woman in a close-up. And I don't know what happened. I, I just suddenly said to my friend, I've got to find her. I must find that woman. And the, and the, com the commercial was about coffee beans in Brazil. You know, the, the mm. instant coffee comes from Brazil. And I said, we'll go to Brazil tomorrow, you know? <laughs> And it's true, but, well, because I was, you know, I was single and, and mm. I, was, I was already already starred in several movies, so I had plenty of money and I could do exactly what I wanted. So did you go to Brazil the next day? No, I didn't. What, what happened was <laughs> I, I suddenly got very excited and, and I had a friend who owned a discotheque in London called Tramp, and I said to my mate Paul, I said, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I'm thinking about this woman, let's go and have a drink with Johnny down, the, down at Tramp, you know, just to sort of... This is the only place I knew that was open that late. You know, oh. it would be open till one o'clock in the morning. I went down there, and then a go another guy came in, and he saw Paul and I sitting there, and he said, "Oh, no girls. What happened to you?" <laughs> you know. So I said, "Well, I'm in love." I said, "I'm in love with a, a girl I saw on the television," and he said, "I've been watching television all evening as well." He said, "I never saw a girl you'd fall." In. <laughs> he said, "Everybody was quite decrepit." I saw in all the shows. <laughs> I said, "I said she wasn't in a show. I said she was in a commercial." He said, which commercial? I said, uh, Maxwell House. 
Oh, he said, uh, I know her. I said, do you really? I said, I'm going to Brazil tomorrow to find her. <laughs> he said, she doesn't live in Brazil. I said, where she live? He said, she lives in the Fulham Road in London, which, no. was, about, which was about a mile away. And he said, I, I work for the agency, that, the advertising agency that made that commercial. And, and so I said, well, you know, I wasn't rude enough to ask him for a, a number. I just said, would you give her my number and I ask her if she will call me, you know? And, and she called me and she said it was OK, you know, she didn't Pretty mind cool. talking to me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so she said, but she couldn't come out with me. I asked her to come out and for ten nights she said she was busy, you know? And, uh, but I persevered with it and, and, uh, and on, on the tenth night she said yes. And then, then she came, she, then I said, I'll pick you up. She said, no, I drive my own car. She was very suspicious of me because... <laughs> I can't imagine why. I don't know. <laughs> no. Well, she later told me she lived in a flat with five other girls and I was known in the flat as the white shark. <laughs> and I didn't know this, of course, <laughs> but she told me later. Uh, and and, and those, so she said, uh, we're going out to dinner. She said, I'll come in my own car, you know. And so I was ready to go and I was waiting in my flat. I was terribly nervous, very nervous. And finally the doorbell went. And in my flat, I have, have had a, you know, those little peep holes. Right. They're a funny sort of lens, and they make everybody look dreadful. You know, your nose oh, sort no. of goes like that. <laughs> I and know. I looked through the peep hole, and even through the peep hole, she looked incredible. So I thought, she must look fantastic when I opened the door. And I opened the door, and there she was. And you were in love. I was instantly in love with her, and she was instantly in love with me, she assures me. <laughs> <laughs> But what I actually... And you were married in 1973? We've been married 20 years, yeah. In yeah, in, yeah. <laughs> because, because it happened that way, because you went from the flat to the tramps and you met him and he knew her, do you believe in, in destiny? I believe the... in some sort of destiny and I couldn't figure it out for a long while why I saw this woman. She is Indian, by the way. She's from... Uh, She's from uh, she's Kashmiri Indian, and she's incredibly beautiful. Yes, she is incredibly oh, beautiful. Yeah. And, and 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 she's such a beautiful person that she would be beautiful if she had an ugly face. She's right. so beautiful as, as a person. Right. Uh, uh, and I couldn't figure out. I thought, now what is that? Why did I go for 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 just that girl? I mean, there were millions of beautiful yeah. girls in London, you know, right. and, and I knew most of them. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I knew all of them. <laughs> and, and I read I, that I, in the woman's washroom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, what was, what's the connection? What is the connection? And then for my 50th birthday, my wife gave me a birthday present, which was we were living in America, and they have these uh, genealogy things. You know, Americans are always trying to find out if they're related to someone in Europe right. and they're, right. they were dukes or kings right. or something. Everybody wants to go back to, You're back Mary to their Queen roots, of Scott. sort of roots. And, and so she gave me this thing. And uh, it was a very bona fide thing. I mean, it would cost something like $5,000 then. And she gave me this birthday present, and they traced my, my history back. And, and I half knew what they were going to find, but I come from... I don't look a bit like it, but I'm half gypsy. And, I gypsy oh. who, and I'm, I'm half gypsies from Ireland. And so... But I knew that half of my family... I thought, they're gypsies. Nobody could be that bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, gypsies, but I, my, no, they were sort of tinkers. They're good gypsies and, and bad gypsies, good gypsies, and you were the yeah, yeah. yeah, mine were the bad. They're, I couldn't even become a good gypsy. I mean, there, <laughs> there is, there is, the, there's the Romany, which is the top, the the gypsy, which is the middle, and and then there's the Didikais. The Didikais. Yeah, the Didikais are the bottom rung. I was a Didikai, oh, right. as, as usual, <laughs> as usual. I couldn't even get in the top of the gypsies. <laughs> so, so we cut from there. And I'd always been interested in, in gypsies, and, and I knew... The, my real name is Morris, and in the English gypsies, the oldest son is always called Morris, and I'm, uh -huh. I'm the oldest son. My father was called Morris, and his father was called Morris, and, and, I, I, and so I knew we were part gypsy from, from that kind of thing. And then I was watching television uh, many years later, and they had a programme on BBC Two, the rather esoteric channel in England, on the history of the gypsy, and no one had ever found out where they came from. Let me guess. Uh, yeah. And they did this whole thing, and they finally proved where gypsies originated, and it was India. So, so it is I destiny. Feel I've come there it is, full you come circle full circle. 
Someone obviously got over the wall because I'm sort of six feet two and blonde. <laughs> 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 it's not an entirely pure strain. <laughs> One of the things I've been reading, I was saying to somebody, I, I was looking forward to meeting you after all. I've gone to bed with you every night this week. For have the, you really? Yes, I have. Every night. Michael and I What's, get Was I good? You were marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> What I've enjoyed about the book is your sense of humor. You've got a marvelous sense of humor. And I, and I was reading somewhere that, and I don't know if you patterned your book on it, but one of your books, one of your favors was David Niven's The Moon of Balloon. Moon is a balloon, which yeah. Is, which is a fabulous, and this, this is, this, the humor in yours is, is similar to, to the wonderful reading that his was. Well, uh, the, I, when they asked me what sort of book I would write, because first of all, he said, you must write a kiss and tell, otherwise we're not publishing it. You know, I said, I'm not writing a kiss and tell. I thought, how can I get out of this? You'd take ten volumes for yeah, all the exactly, kiss and tells, yeah. you know. Yeah, and get a bullet Just in the back of the head sometimes. How about yeah. the London phone directory? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I was decided not to write a kiss and tell, and I thought, how can I sell this book to the publishers that I'm not writing a kiss and tell? What can I get away with? And I thought, I'll say a moon is a balloon. Because I'd, I'd love... The only autobiography I've, I've ever read was, was David's A Moon is a Balloon, and I really laughed. Oh, and and so I said that. And it turned out Moon is a Balloon sold seven and a half million copies. So the publisher said, yes, we'll have we'll that. We'll do that. But you know what else you should do that he did is that he put it on tape. And those lovely tapes that you listen to in your car and he I've read his it. own. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, that's even it, more yeah. wonderful. I, I did it in England. It's not on sale out here yet, I don't think. But I did it in England. And it's very strange because I said... I, when I was doing it, I said to, to the man, I, I said, are, are these for blind people? And, uh, you know, that's what to, it started for. That's what it, it did, started for. But yes, he said, no, he said, blind people like to read in Braille. He said, people listen to these in cars. That's right. And they sell millions of them in yeah. America. I yeah. often, I've heard wonderful books in the car because we do a lot of driving, and that's why I heard David Niven. But it's much more, it's the best is to hear the author reading his own book, particularly if it's somebody of your stature. Well, it, well it's also yeah. if, 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 if the author is an actor, too. I mean, can it, you imagine? Yeah. Uh, I, I read David's book, I didn't hear it, but David's wonderful voice reading that book. We were doing, we had a little guessing game with the audience because you've done over 70 something films and we were trying to get, the, okay, name me all the Michael Caine films and we came up with a bunch of them. But then I, I also read somewhere that you don't watch your own films? No. That's a shame because you're missing some really good films. <laughs> I no, mean, I... some of them are really excellent. <laughs> really? No. I... I, I actually do see them once. I only see Just them the once, ones. you know, but then, uh, you know, and sometimes I'll get on a plane and someone will say, we got one of your movies, you know. Oh, I think, oh God, can I go and sit in the other compartment? <laughs> and then if one of your movies is on television, when, uh, on, on the airplane, uh -huh. and it's a comedy, first of all, you look at everybody to see if they've to got earphones sure on. And they're right, right. Well, wait, first of all, you see how many are listening, <laughs> you know, and you see a guy with no earphones, you think, the bum, he's not watching my movie. <laughs> What's the matter and, with and you? And you hate it. What's the matter with you, you think? <laughs> And then if it's a comedy, I'm watching out the corner of my eye and reading, and I know when there's a laugh, and I look round, <laughs> and I look for the guy who isn't laughing, you know, so I hate him. So by the time I get off the plane, I'm completely You're paranoid. You're exhausted, yeah. I, let me tell you my favourite of all your films. In fact, I, I rented this um, about four months ago. I thought it was such an extraordinary film. And I, somebody told me it was one of your favourites. The Man Who Would Be King. Yeah, the one it's I did, one, yeah. Oh, yeah, what yeah. a fine yeah. film. You should see that again. You were wonderful. <laughs> Well, <laughs> sure, this Sean. Was, for those who haven't seen it, it was with Sean Connery and, and uh. with a great director called John Houston, who is uh, one of my favourites. He's no longer with us, but uh, um, but Sean, before I came away just two weeks ago, Sean Sean lives in Spain and he rang me and he said, "I think I've found something for us to do together." And I said, "What is it?" He said, "I'm not telling you. I'll see you in Hollywood." And so uh -huh. I, I live in I live in Hollywood, and so uh, uh, in the winter. Actually, I live in England, but I spend a lot of time in Hollywood because I work there. And so when I get back, Sean is going to finally turn up at Christmas and show me this so piece perfect. of material that he's found. That would be great. The two of you were oh, wonderful. You must have had a great time working with him. Well, it film. was wonderful because, you see, Sean and I have been friends for 30 years. He's one of my closest friends. And John Houston, who I adored as a, as a director from all his movies, right. and he, he was such a pleasure to work with. I always, I always felt that... Uh, John, John always reminded me of God. He looked like God after a bad night out. You know, John. <laughs> and, and I thought, and I thought, if John ever spoke, if if, God, if you ever heard God speak, it would be John. he would speak like John Houston. John Houston, uh, um, I'll tell you a story, and I do his voice in case people don't know his voice. Uh, he, he's a, he's a wonderful director, and he one day <clears throat> um, I, on the man who would be king, I started a, a, a take. And I was doing fine. You know, I didn't screw up many words or do anything. I was, oh. And suddenly he said, cut. So I said, he's like, I said cut? What for? I didn't do anything. He said, he said, you can speak faster, Michael. He's an honest man. 
<laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, what a so great So I've been guy. very suspicious of people, people who talk speaks. slowly. Yeah. <laughs> Ever since. But he, but he always he always spoke in a very a voice like that. So he was that is about so to tell you some wisdom that was going to come down. What a great... That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know who I would love to have met? I mean, there's uh, you, there are lots of famous people and there's lots of... But one of the one of my favourite people in this book was your mum. Your, and one of my, my favourite... Yeah. Well, one of my favourite stories about your mum being a mother was that when you were a, a, a young lad, and you weren't a very handsome young lad. Not at all, no. And I, I don't know if people know this, but the reason your eyes are, have this bedroom eye stare was you had actually a, a problem with yeah, an infection well, it, in your it, eyes. I have, a, a I have these very heavy eyelids. At, right. at school, they used to call me snake eyes. But when I grew up, the girls used to say, you've got very sleepy, sexy eyes. And right. I didn't tell them what it was. I just told them I was sexy, you know. And yeah, but but you I didn't very tell them I was sleepy. But so. you had you were a slim kid, yeah, yeah, kind of, I, you know. Well, yeah, well, the... the I mean, I was the most unlikely person ever to make it in, in movies because when Become I... Become a sex symbol. Well, that, certainly. Yeah, uh, when, I, when I was about three, I... First of all, I had ears that stuck out, and my mother... That's right. My mother always found people with their ears who stuck out hysterically funny, and she hated it in me, <laughs> and she thought it was ridiculous. So she, do, she used to tape my ears tape back, with, back with elastoplast. Yeah. And now they're so flat. Yeah, that's what I said. I said, now they're so flat, I can't hear anything. They just... <laughs> Because they're supposed to stick out a bit to catch, to, the, to noise. catch the noise. That's now, right. mine, and, and people say things, it goes whizzing straight past me. There's a great but, story about your mum when the boys picked on you and she found out who they were. Oh, yeah, she'd go out. And I, I, what I did is I used to come home crying and the boys, the big boys, picked on me. You know, she'd go out and beat them up. That's really. right. She was, <laughs> she was only a little woman. She was about five feet tall and, 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 and rather tubby all her life. I mean, right. she got quite fat. But, I mean, I was a very unlikely plus prospect. I had this... It's, it's a very, very insignificant eye disease called blepharo, but it's completely incurable. If, if you see... Well, if you see any of those medical movies where a baby is being born, when the baby is taken out, you immediately see the doctor take uh, 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 eye drops, drops and he goes, put drops. It's and you may think, what? Well, that, that's to stop blepharo. Is it silver? They, yeah, something, they, something they put something in it. Bit, yeah. But that's to stop blepharo. Oh, where I was when I was born 60 years ago, in, in where I where I was born, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have sophisticated stuff like that. And so I used to wander around, and I also had rickets, which is a vitamin deficiency, because right. I was born in a depression. And, and my, we were on food stamps. I don't want anybody to start crying about this. Just, <laughs> this sounds like the biggest sub story you've ever heard. It they... sounds completely phony, but it's true. And so I, I used to, I had weak ankles, so I used to walk around with surgical boots on, so, right? What a with sight. these big, big, heavy eyelids. I had my ears stuck back with a lastoplast. <laughs> and I also had a thing called some fight and starts, which is a twitch where I used to go like this. And I always felt, I, I look, later on in life, I, I always look back as I, I must have looked like some. Uh, Gestapo interrogator, so I come along with his boots on, <laughs> and I frightened the daylights out of all the other kids. Did it? Was it difficult for you to accept later on in life when you went from that, and that's how you speak of yourself as a child, to becoming? I mean, you're a sex symbol where women would just, <gasps> you know, is it hard for you mentally to adjust to that? I was just watching how many guys were clapping. <laughs> 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 no, you never think okay. of yourself as a sex symbol because you know what I think. You know what I think about the way women think. If you were a man and you thought of yourself as a sex symbol, uh -huh. you, you would be unattractive to women. What is attractive to women is a man who is interested in in her rather than interested in you himself. You got it. That's it exactly. <laughs> That is it exactly. That's what, yeah. that's what makes men most. That's attractive what makes to men women. attractive. They're interested in a woman. When what I... makes women attractive to men? Is it when they pay attention to you, or does yeah. it matter you, that they're just beautiful? They, they, no, no. The beauty. I mean, I know some of the most unpleasant women in the world, who are beautiful. I've, I've met practically every beautiful woman there is in the world somewhere along the line, right. uh, uh, and and um, some of them you see, and they're so beautiful, and then you start to speak to them. And they get uglier and uglier and uglier as they as they talk, you know. And and it's what's in a woman's spirit. Or you'll see someone else who is a woman who you'll say, well, she's not bad. And then suddenly you start to talk to her, and she will become more and more beautiful. It it, it it's a strange thing. As I right. said, my my wife, who has a very beautiful face, mm -hmm. would be beautiful even if she was ugly. Because she has this because zest. Because it, it's, it's the it's the person. But the, I mean, you know. Uh, um, when you're young, these are your first criteria. 
of yes, course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go out with a woman uglier than me. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> there are lots of wonderful stories. This is a, it's a good read, and I look forward to hearing you on tape to... Uh... I'll have you in my car and listen to you as, as uh, it's, it's been released, but it's not uh, yet in Canada, but we'll look for it. And the last thing to mention, just to mention the, um, your latest movie, number movie 70, whatever it is, with whatever, the Muppets. Yeah, yeah the Muppets. We, we, made a, we made a movie, the Muppets made a movie of uh, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, and uh, I'm the only human being in it. I play Scrooge. What is it? Never. What is it? The actors always say never appear with you know animals and kids. I mean, it's I, I tough. never appear with animals, kids, and muppets. Right. But the one. But the one thing I learned: the muppets are incredible scene stealers. But the one thing I thought of when I started to act in this picture, I thought, the only I must never play around like they do because the only thing that I have, which they don't, is reality. So I had to be absolutely real. And w and what happened in the picture, as I do that. And I had a phone call from the head of Disney yesterday to tell me I had done it. So the picture must be good because he wouldn't have phoned me. He never phones anybody. And so he, it, 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 it's, it's that if I am real, it makes the puppets real. It oh, makes them right. into human beings. That's right. Because, for instance, well, a, a guy says to me, he says, there have been so many Scrooges, and there have. I thought Alastair Sim was the most wonderful Scrooge. Uh, uh, because there have been a lot of versions of A Christmas Carol, and he said, how are you playing this? I said, I'm playing him as a psychopath. <laughs> so he says, you're playing Scrooge as a psychopath? I said, yeah. He said, what makes you think he was a psychopath? I said, listen. I said, my chief clerk is a green frog. <laughs> I said, all the other clerks in my office are rats. I said, if this, if this guy's not off his rocker, who is? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Caine, the book is wonderful. What's it all about? It's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.